Technology Network. We've got a great session lined up for you today. We have Dominic Kaloya here. He's a learning solutions engineer from ELB Learning, the T-Learning Brothers, and he's going to talk to us about three keys to driving employee performance. We'll turn things over to Dominic in just a few moments. I do have a little bit of information I'd like to share with you. I'm Gary Van Antwerp, by the way. I am the producer of the webinar series for Training Magazine Network, and I manage the community. So let me know how I can help you. If you uh, need some help during the session, you can send me a private chat. Just click the plus sign there at the top of the chat to be able to do that if you're in the live session. Sorry if you're watching the recording, that won't work, but hopefully you'll join us for a live session sometime in the future. We've got some great sessions coming up. Day before yesterday, we had a wonderful session about Canva with Danny Watkins. Nobody's a better expert about Canva than Danny is. And if you miss that, if you're and you're a PowerPoint user, man, you really missed something that you need to see. So you can go back and watch the recording. That's okay. She's got another session, a follow-up to that coming up on September 6th. So this is in addition to the kind of more basic uh, version of this webinar that we had earlier this week. You need both, okay? And then on September 7th, Richard Goring is going to be here with his colleague from Bright Carbon, Stefan Brown, going to be talking about how accessible design techniques engage your entire audience right? So I know we've done a few things on accessibility, but if you design, right, if you're an ID or if you deliver training or whatever, you need to know and you need to be constantly vigilant uh, to make your slides and your presentations accessible. That's what Stefan Brown will be here for, and nobody better to bring that to us than Richard Goring. And then I've asked Joe Ganchi to be back on September 7th to start a series of webinars that will go, run through, I think it's March, and he's going to t be talking about a number of free tools in and toys in Windows that'll make your instructional design and development work faster and better. You don't want to miss this. Joe is a true expert. You know him, Joe, e-learning Joe. So come to that uh, if you are an ID and you'll get so much out of it. And you don't want, want to miss anything in that series. OK, now, if you use closed captions, you can look up at the top of the screen there and you find the CC up there. Do you see that? That's how you turn them on. You can just click that and then show captions and you'll be able to move them around, uh, resize them and so forth. OK, the TechLearn conference is coming up. This is the annual conference that we do one year in Austin, then in New Orleans and back and forth like that. You can go to techlearnconference.com to learn about all the different sessions that are going to be there. Sorry, we will be in New Orleans this year, eating beignets and sipping coffee at uh, Cafe Du Monde when we're not in the conference. You can go down to the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and you will see, I'll move that around for you. You see that little handout spot down there? You'll see the, uh, the certificate courses listing. You'll see the TechLearn 23 brochure. And then right underneath that, the third handout down, you'll find the handout for today's session that Dominic has left for us. So, uh, so go down there and check those out and learn all about the TechLearn conference. Hey, before we get started, I just want to thank eLearning Brothers or ELB Learning now uh, to, for helping us create better learning experiences and helping you do the same. You can go to elblearning.com uh, to learn more about that. You're also going to learn today about a book we're going to be giving away uh, during the session uh, today, thanks to ELB Learning. So uh, we'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. Right, right now, let's go ahead and get started with are your learning development development processes holding you back and three keys to driving employee performance. So again, to help us with this, Dominic Kaloya, the learning solutions engineer at ELB Learning. Dominic, welcome back to Training Mag Network. Okay, I see my microphone is on. Everyone's hearing me. Uh, glad to be here and thank you everyone who's joining early. I love to see these early attendants and people attending live. Three keys to driving employee performance. That sounds really interesting. What are these three keys? But before I get to that, I'd like to know a little bit about, since we're attending a webinar where we're talking about improving employee performance, what I'm kind of interested in is what are your performance goals in your organization? So there's, you could check as many of these items that resonate with you. And these could be things that are current goals that you're currently striving for. It could be things that you're anticipating coming up in the next year or so. 
it's kind of i like to know kind of like what you're looking for so what i like to do is maybe customize my presentation a little bit to address some of these issues and as i'm looking at the beautiful uh, bar chart here of, of response engaging learners is high on the list and i've seen that in other webinars i've i've done motivate employees which is closely related to engagement Onboarding new hires is right up there with a nice response rate and developing leaders, leadership training. Yes. Mm -hmm. Document employee performance is kind of low. Uh, reduced customer attrition rate. Well, I'm glad to see that's kind of low. If, you, if that's not an issue for your organization, that is good. But I was looking at some of the comments coming in. And I see that we're all in different uh, areas and different fields. So maybe not everyone is in the sales arena, which is perfectly fine. So, yeah, so the sales effectiveness and reducing customer attrition are on the lower end, which is good for me to know. I will try not to emphasize the sales aspect too much. And engaging learners is staying out front with 85%. Very interesting. Engagement and motivation, very good. Looks like most people have gone ahead and, and voted, uh, Don Make. Shall we go ahead and uh, wrap that poll up? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone for those responses. The three goals, the, th the three keys to performance improvement. We're gonna talk about system design, workflow, which follows the system design, and then how to keep that improvement going. Those are the three goals in a little checklist item right there. But I'm gonna start off with a personal story that would help you understand what I'm talking about when it comes to systems design. Years ago, I purchased a hybrid vehicle. And full disclosure, there's not a picture or an illustration of my car. It looks nothing like that. I, in my dreams, I couldn't afford a car like that. But I purchased a hybrid car back in 2012. Before this green craze started, I was right up front you know, wanting a hybrid vehicle. Why? Efficiency and economy. I wanted to get away from the high gas prices. I wanted to save money. At about 75,000 miles, it was time for me to replace tires. And when I went to shop for the price of the, top, the same brand that came with my car, ouch, it was expensive, which is symbolized by that tire on the left. But then I priced other tires, a brand name tire for much less. Now, my question to you, and the illustrations I have showing the wheels, I'm, I'm talking about just the tire. So the, my decision had, was not influenced by how the tire looked. It was strictly on price, performance. So my question to you is, if someone was buying a car for economy and financial reasons, do you think I purchased the original tire that cost a lot more money? Or did I go with a well-known national brand name tire for less money? What do you think I did? You could drop into the chat one dollar sign if you think I went for the economical tire. Drop in a whole bunch of dollar signs if you think I went for the more expensive one. Oh, wow. I'm seeing single dollar signs exploding on the screen. And for everyone that selected the single dollar sign, you're absolutely correct. You guys are good instructional designers. You know how to define the learning objectives. So you define my objective as being economy. You, you figure go with a brand name tire. That's exactly what I did. And I found an immediate decrease of about 20% in my miles per gallon. Oh my gosh, for someone who purchased a hybrid vehicle for good gas mileage and good economy, what did I do? That one change that one change of selecting a different model tire had a negative result on the performance of my car, which was a valuable lesson to me on systems design. The engineers who designed the vehicle 
carefully selected attire that provided maximum performance on that vehicle, changing that one thing to something that was not finely tuned to that vehicle, uh, reduced performance. Bringing this back to our industry and getting away from the tires and the vehicle and the miles per gallon, what are we talking about in our industry? What's this system where if one thing is out of balance, uh, performance is going to suffer? So I put this together, this little graphic. Performance in the center is going to be influenced by the team, the people on your L&D team that are actually involved in the process. It's going to, to depend upon the content, how you're creating the content, what kind of content that you're creating. How are you delivering this? Is it an LMS? Is it a, a learning management system? Is it in-person training? What kind of tools are you using? And are you cultivating evidence of performance change? Are you collecting data? Are you collecting matrix? Each one of these are integral to the entire performance of the entire system. Now, I'm going to try and make this clearer as you go through the next slides, because this could be something uh, something new for a lot of people. And I know in past companies I've worked for, they didn't have a clue about what I'm talking about right now. And basically trying to make it simple is there's a lot of moving parts, just as, it is, just as there is in a car, there are a lot of moving parts in creating a learning and development, in creating learning experiences, in training employees, in, in training people, in getting results, in moving performance. There's a lot of moving parts. And I've got some categories of those moving parts here. And the arrows may be a little deceiving. It seems like each one of these categories impacts in performance, which it does. But there's also an interrelation between the different components, like the team and the content that you're developing. A lot's going to depend upon the experience and the talent you have on the team and the, the type of content you can develop is going to be very, very much impacted by the tools. And so you can see how all of these items in themselves are interrelated, but I didn't want to start drawing lines between them because it would get very confused. So just keep that in mind. Let's take a look at some examples here. Uh, when one area underperforms, or overperforms, which is not, this is kind of strange. Why am I saying overperforming? Uh, isn't it great that if we have this fantastic high powered team with these master degrees, PhDs working on the team, isn't that good if our team is super, super, super good? Well, if your content creation tools, if your delivery tools are subpar, you could have all the talent on the team that you want. They're going to be wasting a lot of time. It's going to be very inefficient. They're going to be frustrated. So there is also a problem if, if you are overweighted and too heavy in one particular area. But if there's a if any of these items are out of balance are out of balance, then the performance of the whole team is going to suffer. If the performance of the whole team, the whole process suffers, then you're going to be limited as to how much you learn is can improve in performance. We'll take a look at some specific examples. Now, I know there aren't a lot of people interested in sales, so I'll go through this one quickly. But on the right, I've got the a sales process. And what's very interesting, if you're not involved in a sales training situation, you very well may find that the same outline applies to you. But basically, you show or you tell your learner something, give them a, the ability to practice what you just showed them, maybe ask them to demonstrate it to you. For example, in a live classroom situation, you show them something, give them a little practice time, then have them come up in front of, in front of the group one by one and demonstrate how they would do something. And a good instructor is always going to provide feedback and possibly let them demonstrate it again. And ultimately, if you're producing SCORM training, this is typically a test at the end. And then the, optionally, there may be a need to certify somebody that they actually did learn what they did learn. 
What's very similar is if you now with the improvement of sales, what I'm showing on the screen now is how each one of these areas relates to something on this numerical list. So you, as you can see, the team is going to affect one, four, six, it has a lot of impact. Uh, is the team doing live training? Is the team doing virtual training? And I'm sure a lot of us uh, attending right now were involved in online training. With the content, are you building content? Are you buying content? But let's, I'm gonna skip over the rest of the items because I know not everyone is focused uh, on the sales. And let's move on to the next slide about skill building. Now the skill building is very similar, but a little bit different. Again, you wanna show or tell somebody, which is pretty much the beginning of any online experience. You create some content, you gotta share content. You gotta share information with the learners. This is what, this is what you need to learn. Then give them a safe place to practice. I put safe in parentheses because depending upon what you're training people on, you want them to be able to practice and make mistakes. If it's something that's dangerous, like medical training and operating on people, uh, managing a nuclear plant, how do you practice that without blowing things up or, or, or killing somebody? You need to provide a safe place to practice. And while they're practicing, you also need to provide a place or an opportunity for them to demonstrate what they've learned. And then again, a testing at the end and optionally uh, a certification. What I mean by certification is one of the challenges in our industry and the survey results that came back in the beginning where the document results was like hardly anyone checked it off. Let me know if you ever asked to, if anyone asks you, is this working? Is all the money we're spending on this department, uh, is it paying off? Uh, do, you know, what's, do we need to cut the budget? Do we need to expand the budget? It's like, you know, is it really moving the needle? Is it really making a difference? That's really a challenge in our industry. Uh, you get a score based course, you know, Dom got a hundred, uh, you know, Chrissy got, you know, got a hundred. It's like, does that mean that their behavior has changed or just that they took a course, had a short-term memory, uh, aced the exam, and that's it? So here we see some slightly different items. Again, the team is uh, very much uh, influential on all aspects of it. But like with delivery, uh, there's a some delivery platforms, LMS systems, learning experience platforms, uh, have the opportunity for social sharing. And when building a new skill, this could come quite in handy. If now employees are demonstrating these skills, not only am I learning from the people who designed the training, but I'm learning from my colleague, Christy, and I'm learning from Gary, which is, uh, and, I, and I'm sharing my insights with them also, that, that that could be a good way for people to build new skills. When it comes to uh, tools, uh, immersive VR learning can be an excellent way to have employees practice new skills, even if it's in a nuclear plant or in an operating room, because it's virtual, it's going to be safe. And then evidence is, hmm, so you're practicing uh, how to do a, a very sophisticated skill. It could be soft skills. Uh, interrelating, communicating with people. How do I know after all the training that uh, Christy can is really ready to go out into the, into the so social field and deal with people on a one-to-one? -one? If I was able to to watch a video recording of uh, Christy actually responding to different critical situations, that would pretty much provide the evidence I need to know that she's ready to go prime time. And now for your number one response, engaging learners. I put numbers here on this one because now we're not talking about a sequence of events. We're talking about just different things that would enable you to make your learning more engaging and more motivating. And number one is relevance. If the training is relevant, it's going to be more engaging. 
having a variety. So it's not the same old, same old, same old. So if you do something cute with some animation and you use that same animation over and over and over again, it pretty much gets pretty routine. And people start tuning it out. Challenging. Is there, is there any element of a challenge to really motivate people to, I want to try that again and, and do better. Is it safe? Do, do, is it safe for employees to try something and get it wrong without being embarrassed? I mean, I remember one time I started working at a job and I'm like on the job for like seven days, 10 days. And all of a sudden there's a company wide game and I'm not knowing anything. And I'm trying to play the game in one way, not realizing that there was another strategy to playing the game. And I'm called out as ha as being the last one you know, to, to put in an answer, to get answers wrong. It's like, that was kind of embarrassing for the new guy on the block. But, you know, that's, that's all in the picks. Uh, leaderboard, badges, uh, and does it scale? All right. So depending upon, and let me click the next button here. Okay. So depending upon uh, what tools you're using. So there's different tools for adding games or having a whole gamification platform. Uh, some of these things can be deployed in your delivery system if, if you're having a, a good uh, LXP. Uh, and evidence of performance, uh, depending upon the tool you use to add gamification and make learning more fun. There's metrics that are supplied on a user level, on a question level. So all these different things can help you create more engaging learning that will actually improve the performance of your learners. Now, break time. I'm going to pause from what I said so far is anyone like, what the heck is he talking about? It's like, I haven't heard anything yet that I can use. I mean, just throw into the chat. Like, uh, yeah, you know, you know, I'm with you. It's like, is anyone kind of frustrated or are you with me? Are you getting it? And the reason why I wanted to pause right now is because I've worked in a lot of different companies where they didn't even know this how there's very there's different moving parts in in an l and d department and an over or under balance in any one of those elements is going to perform how well you get to improve your employees and okay i'm seeing people are with me that's i'm impressed you you know you guys are good because this can be a very difficult uh, task to uh, comprehend Easy enough for me, who's been involved with it for many years, to try and take what I know and put it on a couple of slides. But I'm, I'm trying to put myself in your seat. And if this is like new to you, are these slides sufficient? But um, I'm glad that uh, most of you guys are with me. And Christy, keep an eye. On, I see some questions are popping up. Keep an eye on that, Christy, because I want to make sure we come back to those questions. So basically... Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, the thing is right now what I'm seeing is a lot of um, questions about immersive learning. Uh, you don't need a headset for it. Uh, Maria has some really good questions. What's the best approach to if your delivery team is not adopting new immersive tech for students? What I was going to say with the scenario VR, there's an AI feature, so you don't have to use a camera. I would say showing a pilot just so people can imagine it is very effective. So, um, yeah, and there's a free trial of scenario VR. Okay. I've got Sorry. a webinar coming up next week that's actually going to show the virtual reality learning in a totally different way than one might typically think of it. So you'll find out more about that at or you'll you'll, you'll see how you can find out about that at the end of this uh, yeah. this webinar. Okay. Although Elizabeth is also asking you, Dominic, about yeah. she's not following the connection between the numbers and the LND system. She's wanting me to explain a bit more. Okay, you, you, I, your voice kind of dropped off. What was that? She's asking about the connection between the numbers and the LND system. She wanted you to explain a bit more about um, this about, one here. I think so. Um, she's typing. So uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, Gary will talk. Gary will cover it. I got, yeah, Gary's got it. Okay. Gary's got it. 
There you yeah. go. I put the question on the uh, on the screen for you. Elizabeth asks, uh, she's not following the connection between the numbers and the L&D system. So could you explain that a little bit more, Dom? Okay. The Let me get this out of the way here. Ah, thanks. Okay. So on, on this slide that you're looking at, the letters, uh, when I put them in the in the categories here. So for example, tools, uh, the tool that you use to uh, add games and add a gamification platform is going to involve all of these items here. So, the, so meaning if you have a good tool, you'll be able to do everything. If you have a medium tool, you'll do some, but not all. And if you use a poor tool or something that comes free with something else, you'll be able to do something, you know, you know, you'd be very much limited. Uh, the same thing with the, uh, with the like a delivery platform. Uh, a delivery platform could provide some variety that would engage your, your learners. A, a delivery platform could provide a leaderboard, some do. And some delivery platforms will actually have badges and prices integrated in them. Uh, delivery platforms, typically there's no multiplayer feature. Uh, t delivery platforms, unless you build something, there's typically they're not strong in the safe area to retry stuff. Uh, and relevance, well, that you know, you can you can make anything relevant or not relevant. That's more involved with the content. So you see A, B, and C. Your content can be made relevant, have a variety, and have challenging. So I'm trying to associate which categories are most likely relating to this, and. It was the same with the numbers, the same, the same type of a thing. By the way, all of these slides you will have in a in a printout in, in PDF format, and you can study this closer. So I'm glad to see that most of you guys are with me with the break. And we were on we were on this slide. If you want to simplify it, start with the performance goals. What am I trying to achieve? Am I trying to get a, a, a group of employees to be more confident in a certain skill? Am I trying to uh, develop uh, leaders that are able to deal with a diverse uh, employee base and, you know, in an unbiased way? Uh, you know, what are your goals that you're trying to focus on? And then, even though the previous slides had a lot of different categories, the core factors would be the team, what you're creating and how you create it and how you're delivering it, a lot of it's gonna revolve around that. And if you focus on this, and since most of you are involved, are interested in engagement, so let's say I take a look at my team and I have a, a, you know, a meeting team, got some talent on the team. It's not too big, it's not too small. Uh, we've got a couple of tools for creating different, ki different kinds of content. We've got, we're kind of happy with our LMS or LXP platform, uh, but we're still frustrated you know, that we're not, be able, we're not able to create with all this, we're not able to create content and we're learning experiences that are, that are as engaging as you want them to be. That analysis is going to show you that you need to bring in another tool. If your analysis was that, you know, we hate our LMS, we hate our, our delivery platform, okay, it, it, we've had it for 10 years, we've outgrown it, then you may, then you may start looking for a different delivery platform that has some engagement features built in, not to not to say that you would still not you know, take on another tool that specializes in that, but this is this is how you're looking thinking with the systems uh, approach on that how these things need to be in alignment. They all need to be contributing to performance performance goals right here. Okay, workflow matters. So here I have an example where there are some items that are in small circles like the E and the team. Some items are in bigger like tools and some are really big like delivery and content. And this is showing how the different categories, if they're out of balance, uh, you know, what might happen. If there's too much attention on developing content, and little little attention paid to the team, this could result in a very frustrating workflow. Uh, I had the opportunity to work at a very, very large company recently, 
and we had two training managers in our department and each manager had totally different outlook on how to manage their team. Fortunately, I was in the one that gave me full reign, carte blanche, and I was able to create all this cool stuff and actually and that's learn new skills and integrate new skills into the learning experiences I created. Years later, I'm looking at learning content built under the direction of the other manager. And the other manager was, well, I don't know the, the, the better tools, so we'll just use the simpler tools. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Text and pictures and a next button, that's, that's your online learning, really? And I'm doing interactions and animations and, 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 and collecting data on the back end so we could analyze results. And it's like, oh my gosh, what a difference. So, that, so here, if you are focused on just creating the content and just pushing it out the door, uh, you may, and you spend less time on developing your team and less time on selecting the proper tools, then your ability to improve the performance of your learners is going to be limited because you're not getting all the full efficiency that you would if all of these were in alignment. And the last one stands for, I'll show you the next row here. The last one stands for evidence. Without that last component, and I know very, very few people said they were interested in that, but if you're not collecting important learner metrics, if you don't know how to show to your stakeholders that you are, what the efforts that you're doing and what your department is doing is valuable to the organization, you're subject to subject cuts, you're subject to you know, layoffs. And at the big executive meetings, who in the world talks about the learning department? Uh, many companies do not value the learning department simply because the learning department has not proven their value to the company. And one of the ways to do that is if you could document results. If you could show Dominic uh, at, in January and his level of performance, and then show Dominic's performance again in September, and there's a big improvement, then it, undeniably the training has improved results. So here we're seeing how if you pay attention to the importance of elements in each of these categories, including evidence, you have a, a system, a workflow that's going to maximize results. Decisions have consequences. Whoa, we've got this really scary looking graphic over here. Another real life story. I'm working for a very, very large global company and the company decides after doing their own study, they decide to change LMS systems. Perfectly valid thing. It's something that's done you know, periodically and they, no one consulted me. I mean, who am I? The global company, I'm a nobody. I'm just a number for the company. They changed the LMS system and they turn off the old system after whatever it is, 30, 60, 90 days before we were ready. I mean, this is at a time when we were replacing all flash. So going from the old system to the new system, uh, flash was being, uh, was being uh, expired, was, it was no longer being supported. We had to make sure all of our interactions that were built in Flash were rebuilt you know, without Flash. And we did not have the time. And somebody turned off the old system. Loose, we had no access to our old courses. And it's like, who in the world made that decision? We had to hire outside contractors to help, to help us at a, with a mad scramble at the end. Um, it was a total disaster. A multi-billion dollar company. Why? They simply were not paying attention to all the different departments and no one ever consulted the team that was going to be doing the work. And somebody with no experience in change management decided to pull the plug on the old before checking with us to make sure we were okay and didn't need the old stuff anymore. Anyway, that's another personal story. The third element, okay, is continuous improvement. So here I built out a pyramid and you see the little quote there, you fail to plan, you plan to fail. How do you plan without data? How do you plan without information? So on this pyramid, you can see the small piece at the top, the S 
stands for SCORM. You develop a SCORM course, it's, you know, you, it has a test, you come back with a grade, you come back with a completion, a very, very, very small amount of data. The LMS system or learning experience platform may provide additional data. You know, how much time employees are spending on courses, uh, you know, the, the progress, have they started a course? Is it in progress? Is, uh, is it completed? Might even be able to capture some you know, custom question in the data as we go down the pyramid scale a little bit. Uh, a lot of AI tools, or actually not AI tools, but a lot of AI functionality is appearing with a, with a lot of tools to help us uh, and will help generate additional data. And I put video coaching at the bottom. And the reason why I do is I have a passion for video coaching. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, there are several tools out there that allow employees to record themselves and submit it for review and for feedback. But what I like about that is after all the learning has taken place, you could wind up with a final video that shows how Christy, uh, at the end of the training, is now amazing, doing doing phenomenal. All right. So if anyone asks me, uh, you know, what are you doing? Is is it producing any results? I go, yeah. I go take a look at Christy, who started with the company six months ago, and now take take a look at how she's speaking so eloquently about the company, how she's dealing, how, how she's dealing with customers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's proof. I trained Christy. Christy's doing phenomenal. Okay, so uh, that could be very powerful in justifying what your department is doing. And it also, when you get the feedback from these items, what if Dominic is not doing perfect? See, this is valuable information to you as designers and you as the learning leaders. You take that information, analyze the metrics that come from the system, and improve your learning. So you can get to the point where you're showing your stakeholders, we are doing, we're a dynamite training team. We're elevating people's performance. In the age of AI, what's holding you back? Think of the big picture, which is this whole system design concept that we've been talking about. And someone brought up, I think I saw something about the cost. So take a look at this slide. Uh, on the top of this balance bar, we've got the actual cost of purchasing something and the time it takes in learning it and the effort it takes to making the change. All of these are negatives. It's, it's a cost of money, time, and effort. But if the return is bringing in new solutions, uh, AI-powered innovations, and a greater return on investment, you notice I've made the green arrow bigger than the red arrow. If the return is greater than the cost, price is no object. If by bringing on an, a gamification platform, if by bringing on a video coaching platform that enables you to understand how your training is doing, improve your training and get better results, and those better results are bringing in additional revenue, or those additional results are solving problems, or those additional results are getting some sort of recognition in the field and justifying what you're doing, then it's worth the expense of bringing these new technologies on. So as we sum up, when learning and development efforts get a flat, you don't reach your destination. You don't get to the learner performance improvement levels, and that's the destination that you want to be at. Then it's time to get back on track to maximizing employee performance, like I said, through the analysis, through a systems uh, approach, and through bringing in, and by filling in the gaps. So a final poll as we wrap up. What areas, now that we've discussed this, what areas do you find that may be over or, underperform, uh, over or underperforming We'll take a look at these results and give a discuss that for a moment before we wrap up. And it looks like I'm doing pretty good with the time. So I'll have a little Q&A time. You are doing great, Dominic. And thanks to everybody for completing the polls. You know, I'm finding these results 
very, very interesting. And, I, and I've seen this before, which I think is a indication of my teaching abilities, I think. <laughs> because earlier in the polls, the documenting of the results was like, you know, very, 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 very little interest. It's taking the lead now. So I think one of the things that we've learned is we need to pay more attention to the metrics that we collect and actually use those metrics to actually improve what we do and then go to our stakeholders and prove to them that we are generating the results that, uh, that, that they're demanding and that, which is the reason why we're here for, doing a little screen capture of that because I find that very interesting. Team composition, okay, let's, okay, our delivery system. You know, one of the things I do a lot of demoing at, at ELB Learning is our learning experience platform. And it's, there's no one delivery system that is perfect. But I got to tell you, when I moved from previous jobs, working with some of the major, most expensive LMS systems, and I saw what we've got for a fraction of the money, it's like, oh my gosh, there's some neat things here that are impossible in the, in the more expensive uh, platforms. So I'm glad to see that uh, if you guys want any demos on that, you, you have to reach out to me. Let's see what else ranks up high here. Show ROI for L&D. Yeah, that and the metrics, I mean, amazing. From the bottom, it came up to very high in demand. And I've got a lot of ways that I could show you to get that done. All right. Lack of budget. Wow, I'm great. Great to see that that's like the least in demand here. Uh, content development ability, that's low too. Excellent. You guys are good at developing content. That is great. Okay, I think we could close out the, the poll and move on to the next slide and open up a Q&A. But what I'm gonna to explain to you right here is, I'm hoping you reach out to ELB Learning. We've got tons of products that you could add to, which you, to the infrastructure that you currently are using. We could just add stuff to it. The orange barcode will take you right to the ELearning uh, elblearning.com slash the studio to learn about these products here. Uh, now, something that we're starting new for the first time. For the first time, I've got a barcode up here where you could join my personal mailing list. And the only thing I'm going to use the mailing list for is to occasionally email you when I'm doing webinars or I'm doing or I posted some interesting blog posts. That's it. I'm not turning it over to the marketing department. You're not going to be solicited to buy anything. Uh, come September next month, I've got not one, not two, not three, but I'm giving four different webinars. And, you know, last week is like two back to back. Two of them are really going to be exceptional. Uh, I'm doing things differently, not just showing a PowerPoint. I'm not having you shared with Christy and marketing what I'm doing yet. But uh, you'd not, if you found this one interesting and informative, you're not going to want to miss that. But if you join my list, I promise I'm not going to misuse it. I'm not going to share it. I'll just let you know when I've got some exciting stuff come up. And if you want to schedule time with me, you got that last link on the bottom. But with that, let's do Q&A. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Dominic, before we do the Q&A, uh, we have a, a, a special little announcement we need to make. And that is we had said we were going to give away some books and we have 14 winners that we've selected. Uh, and uh, so here's the, here they are. Karen Hughes, Anna Marie Rice, Tanya Ratliff Garrison and Lakeisha Clark and Jennifer Thomas, Casey Close. Donna Barnaby, Kevin Schumann, Rachel Miller, Dale Knowles, Merlin Mendonca, and Sandra Smith, Oscar Harrell, and Alex Galloway. So congratulations to all of you from ELB Learning, from eLearning Brothers Learning. And uh, Dominic, do you want to have anything to say about this, uh, about this book, by the way? Well, that's a lot of winnings. Uh, Christy, which book is this? You, you could probably talk to it better than I. So this one is actually how to use Lectora. Um, it's written by Diane Elkins and Chris Shikana Paxton. And the only parts that are missing, we can kind of send visually to you, which is how they we did, redid the PowerPoint import. So now if you have a PowerPoint deck and you want to smoothly turn it into a course, you can. So we added that. Then we have the AR 
uh, AI capability, which is um, it, basically you just put in a topic and it helps you brainstorm, spits out slides. But um, yeah, I'll put in my email address in a second. So, or Gary, now that I have names, I can reach out to you guys and have you fill out a form just so you can put in your mailing address and, and we'll send you a book. So enjoy it. Um, and we have a free trial to Lectora for 30 days. It's also very affordable, comes with the asset library, review link, um, you know, so enjoy it. And thank you. And so Christy's going to be reaching out to all the winners. Uh, she already has the list in her email. She's going to be reaching out to you and ask you to send her your email, uh, pardon me, your mailing address, your correct mailing address, because we realize that a lot of the ones that we have uh, in Training Mag Network on file for you may have changed since you joined and there was a pandemic and everything. So keep an eye on your uh, on your email for that. And she is all also giving you some uh, other ways to get in touch and give her that information. So, Dominic, thanks a lot for uh, taking time to do that. Let's go ahead with some of these questions now, because we do have some people have been patiently waiting instead, uh, including uh, Rebecca Wolf. She's been waiting quite a while and she wanted to know if you could provide an analysis for leadership development where there isn't a clear goal, such as sales or ability to use a new system. You can see, Dominic, I'm not sure if you can see the question over here. On the yes, right. I can. Okay, great. So for leadership development, I think you're asking uh, what kind of metrics can, you know, can, be, uh, can be used. If I'm doing leadership training and there's no clear goal because a good leadership, a good leader is going to be able to have the ability to respond correctly and appropriately to unforeseen uh, situations. So the video coaching platform, I think, would be very good for documenting that. So for example, I've got a training program for leaders, and that may consist of a series of scoring-based courses. Uh, maybe you, you purchase some off-the-shelf generic leadership training courses. Uh, there may be some webinars and some virtual meetings where you know, people come together and there's Q&As and, and there's demonstrations and stuff like that. Uh, and then you could build in SCORM, you could, you could build a role play where they click on different responses, how they would respond to, to these different situations. However, all right, how do you know if Dominic is able to think on his, on his feet and deal with situations appropriately? So after that training, if I was presented with a challenge and then asked to respond. Now, the video coaching, the way it works is uh, the employee can practice as many times as he or she wants to and then submit the best video. Uh, but in, uh, And that's good for training purposes. But if you wanted to show stakeholders that Dominic was actually ready to take a management position because he could deal with a whole bunch of diverse situations, give me three or four video challenges where you explain the situation, my camera turns on, there's no practice. Dom, a fight breaks out, these two women, they're, pull, they're pulling each other's hairs. It looks like, it's, it looks like, it looks like it's, it's getting very dangerous there in the lunchroom. What do you do? Okay, there's no time for me to, to look at my notes. There's no time for me to think about it right off the bat. So basically you're simulating a crisis situation, real time, and watch how I, how I uh, respond to that. Then you and your other decision makers, your other leaders can evaluate my performance and decide whether I qualify or not. I hope that's what you were looking for. Next. Ah, thank you, Dominic. Appreciate it. Uh, Maria Z asks, what's the best approach if your delivery team is not adopting the new immersive tech for students? This is interesting. If your team is not adopting the new immersive technology. So I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, are they resist, you're making it available to them to use and they're not using it. Then you've got to train the trainers uh, and show them the benefits of why you bring, why you're bringing it on. And, you know, depending upon your learners, uh, that could be a challenge in itself. Uh, if you're, if you're asking why they're not, getting that technology 
then possibly getting a demo of the of the tool, like the scenario VR, we give you a free demo of the tool and actually create building something as a pilot to then bring on to your staff. Because we've got plenty of examples for a variety of industries, but if you want to personalize it, you know, we can work with you, uh, side by side with you, build out a demo, you take that demo into your company and then you get approval. So I think I kind of answered two different questions. Okay, and I look like Maria was giving us a little clarification, but then stop because you answered her question. So we'll find out. Uh, Lakeisha asks, uh, with the necessity around creating more inclusive content, taking into account accessibility standards, what impact have you seen on development and delivery of learning content? And then she says, my primary challenges have been in creating accessible animations without losing engagement interactivity. That question comes up a lot, especially with the virtual reality. Some things are going to be by nature uh, focused on certain senses, but animation to me is very visual. So perhaps if you had an alternative that actually described in words what was taking place. So for example, if I showed a racing car racing down the road and smashing into a brick wall, then I would, ha I would have that audio, okay? The racing car, is, we, we're using a racing car in this, in this uh, animation to symbolize somebody who is not aware of their surroundings in a work environment. Now they go full speed ahead. So we're showing a racing car driving and slamming and breaking apart against a, against a brick wall. So you could have that as an alternative for those that are visually impaired. But that is a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dominic. Appreciate it. And then Tabitha uh, asks, what are your suggestions in creating content that will connect to a multi-generational audience? <laughs> okay. Uh, years ago, I developed what I call the learner intelligence adaptive design model. And, you know, ping me and I'll send you uh, a link to the website that explains all this. It's, it's nothing that you purchase. It's just a way of designing courses where there's different ways of explaining something. And what I like to do is I like to put the user in control. So I'll give you an example. Okay. I like reading. I could, I could, I like learning by reading. I could follow my own pace. I could pause. I could read things that, that are a little difficult to understand. But sometimes I get tired of reading and I want to see a video. Uh, sometimes I like an animation helps. So what if I built a course that had a text-based version, an animation-based version, an interactive version, and a video version? You know, then it's like, well, depending upon your learning style, depending upon you know your age you may prefer a different a different presentation what if you had the learner be be able to select how they want to learn so with me i'll start off in text space i'm reading i'm reading reading and it's like oh i want to see a video i switch the video i click the next button i'm seeing another video it's like well i don't want to keep seeing video i'm in control so providing multiple modalities and letting the learner control which modality they want is the way to cater to multi-generational audiences in one course. Well, Dominic, thank you. And I think we've run out of questions, but I have a question for you. What's the most frequent question that you get? What, what's the most common question that you're asked almost every time? always wondering like how do i use ai and it will ai you know you know is it a threat to my position and it could be but that's up to people if they are willing to accept for what ai produces which is not as good as what you and i can produce then it's going to be a threat so uh, uh so it de depends upon the topic uh like with this with today's webinar very very few people involved in sales you know sometimes i have a lot of people that are involved in in sales training 
So that, you know, that is an excellent question. And I don't know that there is any most common one. Okay. Well, you know, that's an honest answer too. We had about 22% of uh, today's audience involved in sales uh, and in sales training uh, one way or another. So, yep. Uh, w when we do a webinar over in sales and marketing <laughs> management, uh, then uh, we may have a different result. Well, in the meantime, then I'd like to thank you and uh, thank ELB, E-Learning Brothers uh, Learning for uh, today's session. And you've done a wonderful job uh, of making this not only uh, interesting, but engaging, and we appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who have not already listed your takeaways in that poll over on the right, we'd really appreciate your comments. Hi, Brenda, thank you for coming again. Um, and oh, you know what? Uh, Kayleen just snuck a question in here for us. So since we've got an extra couple of minutes here, Dominic, let's go ahead and answer this one. She says, how can I use VR to create learning for working in various software systems? <clears throat> what I like about that, that's a good question because a lot of people think that VR is limited to, I put a camera someplace and it's going to be the training has to be in a physical environment. But I'm watching right now for a webinar I'm giving next week, and that's going to show VR in a different light. So now, if this is for VR training for a software situation, then the VR is going to let you spin around in a 360 degree. So what if you were able to click on doors or something and each door presented a different uh, software, ch software challenge? And in that software challenge, you had to click and interact with the software in a certain way. And keep in mind that the VR tool that I'm talking about will let you put in text uh, video, audio snippets, and even drag and drop interactions. So, if, and, and even multiple choice questions. So you have a lot of different types of uh, content that you could put into a 360. But one of the things that the, that the 360 offers is a non-linear approach. So if I had a room with six different things to click on, and I told, and I gave the instructions that each room is going to pre present a different software challenge for you know, for training purposes. Then I could even show a video on how to do it, and then have an interaction where they had to actually do it themselves. So this would be nonlinear. They could they could do it in any order that that they want, which means everyone's going to have a different learning path through the course. Yeah, actually, I was going to add to that. I was going to say that for software simulation, I mean, just even getting people to click buttons. If you go to Scenario VR, check out Scenario VR, we actually have sample courses where <laughs> at conferences I've shown people how to bro brew beer by clicking on buttons. So, you know, hopefully that works, something like that. Well, thank you, Christy. And Dominic, thank you once again. Thanks to everybody for coming today. Uh, we are out of time. And so we look forward to the next time uh, that we have uh, Dominic and other folks from ELB Learning back. Meanwhile, keep an eye on your uh, email. I think uh, Christy will be notifying you when uh, Dominic has another event uh, coming up, too. So yeah, we look forward to seeing you then. Yeah, and also, then Gary, open all the free trial links and stuff so you can kind of build your own software simulation with a lot of our free trials and tools and all kinds of free goodies. So um, I just want to thank you all. Mm -hmm. Bye, and everyone. Thanks for, thanks for all the questions. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Well, Dominic, you did a great job of answering them. And folks, you did a great job of giving us your questions. So thanks for everything. We'll look forward to seeing you the next time. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. If you're in Florida, like Dominic, stay dry and, and uh, stay safe. Take care, everyone. Thank you.